Last night you saw it start with Steve Jobs, one of the premier assholes of all time. What are the takeaways about Steve? Other than he was a ruthless asshole. Don't tell me the obvious. But I've heard the motherfucking story. 6,000 years we roamed the fucking desert. 6,000, oh, I'm so fucking tired of that Jewish story. I can't, I want to throw up. For those of you that are going to engage in uh, pugilism this afternoon, uh, and even though when you signed in, you, you uh, ostensibly said yes or no, I'm going to put this list here because every single group changes, somebody changes their mind. Some, and whether you do it or not, I don't give a fuck. So don't, whether you do it doesn't mean you're going to succeed. But since you change your mind, because you're willy nilly, because you're, you're indecisive, for those of you that have changed your mind, come up here and either add your name or take your fucking name off. So when I'm standing there announcing in front of YouTube, not that I don't mind embarrassing myself or anything, uh, and John Jones, and you're not even there because you're hiding in the bathroom or some shit. John Jones, where's John Jones? Oh, he's hiding, no, he's in the bathroom. That's how you've lived your fucking life. So if you're gonna duke it out, put your fucking name down here. If you don't, take your fucking name off. So I don't chase you around like a cunt. Now, speaking of cunts, I told you yesterday, you didn't do the fucking homework, or you didn't watch the movies, etc. You were out, right? Did anybody not understand that? I meant it. I don't care if you've seen the cocksucking movie 50 fucking times. You didn't look at it like you looked at it last night. This isn't a fucking joke to me. You represent potential numbers on my big board. Otherwise, I don't give a fuck if you die today. That's all you represent to me is a fucking number. You didn't deserve to. Everybody in this room should have died at childbirth. This isn't a fucking joke to me. Only difference between you and the fucking morons on YouTube is you're here. Most of you wasted 20 grand. This is, a, this is a joke, this sly. To say that you weren't programmed for success is a fucking understatement of Quran, biblical, and everything, all, all kind of proportion. Now, even though Baron, the thing about little Baron Trump was yesterday, and I said just casually as a flippant comment, well, you, none of you were raised this way. I should have spent all fucking day on that slide or all that comment. You know what Don, uh, President Trump would do to Don, uh, the, the little uh, the Baron, the little shit Baron, if he didn't do something or show up? He'd get my fucking beaten. All of them got beatings. This pisses me off, as you can tell. And I'm not the guy that you want to piss off. Not in this fucking seminar. You still got four and a half days to go. I can make this unbearable. Everybody will quit. Last night you saw it start with Steve Jobs. One of the premier assholes of all time. What are the takeaways about Steve? Other than he was a ruthless asshole. Don't tell me the obvious. He wrote his daughter off every anyway. way. Until he saw, thought that she was smart. Not that, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to put Napoleon Hill in the same category as Steve Jobs, that he abandoned his son because he was born with no ears. Steve, uh, sorry. Go ahead. He was relentless in his pursuit of his vision, regardless of how many people try to get his way or, or dissuade him. And I, I did some work back in the 80s for Apple. You couldn't confuse Mr. Jobs with the facts. And I am very similar. My facts. We have intergalactic truth. We've got intercontinental truth. We have national truth. And we got our motherfucking truth. None of these guys, or almost none of these guys that we're going to talk about this week can be dissuaded from their mission. Their OCD in that way, the compulsive disorder, their mission, that's it. And whereas most people, and that's why I give the, uh, the analogy of the speed bumps, some of you are going to see, uh, uh, I see speed bumps, you're going to think it's a Grand Canyon or fucking Mount Everest, you know, and it's just a fucking speed bump. When I say that I, I can't remember the last time I failed, Sally would remind me, you know, the, the, these minor things that have happened over the last 20 years, that I, but I don't see, I don't consider them failures. Just didn't work out, I just changed, changed the circumstance around and try again until I, I make it work. Whereas most people, most people would have given up trying to change the personal development industry like I have in the last 26 years. Because I grossly underestimated that you had no self-esteem. It's still, it's marvels. When I used to tell my dad when he was still alive, he didn't understand, well, if you don't think I didn't understand it, well, fuck. He didn't understand it even more. He says, uh, I, I don't understand, so I don't know what to tell you. I said, well, I, I bit off, my alligator mouth bit off more than my hummingbird ass can take. I mean, I, I grossly underestimated this shit, dad. He just kind of giggled, laughed, never comment. The greatest thing about my parents, other than when I show you how they programmed me, not the way I'm telling you to program kids, but the way they programmed me, was they never got in my business. They never offered a fucking opinion in all their years that they were alive. Not one fucking opinion from my mother and my dad. Not one fucking comment how I was living my life other than trying to keep me out of jail. 
because their, their goal was to keep me alive until I reached the age of reason. I asked my dad two questions in all his life. He lived to be 91. Two questions I asked him. One when he was about 65, 66, 67 ish, and one when he was about uh, late 70s. And he, he answered uh, like I thought he was going to answer. And, um, but he never. Whereas part of the reason you feel parental guilt, excuse me, I like to call it Jewish guilt, because the Jews have the best guilt model alive. I mean, they, they, I'm not saying they invented fucking guilt. But I've heard the motherfucking story. 6,000 years we roamed the fucking desert. 6,000, oh, I'm so fucking tired of that Jewish story. I can't, I want to throw up. And we're surrounded by Arab countries. And we're all by ourselves and we got to build a fucking wall. <laughs> so what? The Arabs on the other side say, because I've been partners with them. Dan, there's a reason why the fucking Jews have no oil and gas. Allah's will. There's a fucking reason. And they got a whole litany of stories. But the reason why you have parental guilt is because they continue to stick their nose unwantingly in your business, either directly or indirectly. If they don't directly tell you, they tell your brother or sister, or they tell a cousin. Okay, Steve Jobs, what else? Yes, sir. Uh, all his uh, employees are numbers, even like Wozniak, he started Apple with, he's totally uh, disattached from emotion. Wozniak is the mentee of one of my mentees now, which we'll talk about later today, the Woz, and uh, we're going to have some uh, detailed information that the Woz gave to one of my mentees, one of my Hall of Fame mentees, that uh, is quite, well, it, it's not uncharacteristic of what we saw Mr. Jobs do, but it's quite remarkable that he did it to the Woz, his lifetime buddy, yada, yada, yada. Well, Mr. Jobs didn't have any fucking lifetime buddies. He didn't fucking chill! And contrary to what the YouTube fucker said, although he was aware of uh, uh, Buddhism and that stuff in his young life, he didn't get serious about religion until they said he was going to fucking die. Then he got holier than shit, as you do, as you do. What else about Mr. Jobs? Yes, sir, ma'am. If you don't bring value to the business, then you're going to be 86 pretty quick. So everyone's replaceable. Everybody is. Uh, and you're going to see how replaceable you are. The first, because uh, I, I, I made a list last night. Who's going to have the first board meeting? I already know. And see how much value you bring. What, somebody else over here. Yes, sir. Uh, he was a control freak. He regarded himself as a conductor of the orchestra. And I told you the first night that for the first time in your lives, you're going to be the conductor because you're going to know all the financial instruments. But there's only one that we use, commercial <laughs> debt. All the others are just bullshit. What else? Yes, sir. It shows how hard it is to be at the top of the game because nobody shares your vision. They don't see it like you do. And remember, the board, when you're picking your board, starting with the uh, chairman, they are going to be a reflection of you, your vision. The vision starts at the top. And if you pick, remember I said, the challenge is you're going to pick people that you feel comfortable with, which is wrong. This program teaches you to be comfortable being uncomfortable 100% of the time. When you wake up in the morning to the time you go to sleep, being uncomfortable, stretching your, getting outside your comfort zone. The reason that you're here, the, in your situation of life today, and the same reason that the kids on the YouTube are, is you have uh, <laughs> not been able to get out of your comfort zone successfully. And the few times that you've gone outside your comfort zone, you failed. And nobody likes failure. What else? Yes, sir. You never give praise to other people for whatever you've accomplished. Yeah, well, boy, I have a thing on my desk to remind me because I don't believe in praise. I don't believe in it. I never needed it. Why in the fuck does anybody else need it? I literally have a thing on my desk to remind me to tell my kids I love them and to give praise. And all the years that I was with the Onassis people, maybe once I got praise from Mr. Grazos. Once. And that, depending on what you consider praise, is questionable whether that was really praise or not. He would brag about me to the others in the Onassis group, which pissed off the Greek guys because I wasn't Greek. But not to me. Not to me. What else about jobs? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, when he had thoughts like of his daughter, like flashes of them, he immediately refocused on himself. So he would default. Because that was, he considered thinking um, emotionally about his uh, own uh, progeny was a weakness. And so he'd refocus. And that was, his def uh, was one of his defaults. And um, reframing from default is a motherfucker. It's just hard. You know, for those of you that are uh, 30 years old, uh, you've spent about 235 or 240,000 hours in, of life, or let's call it a quarter of a million hours. Even though this thing's about 50 hours long, not counting the homework, just, I mean, in, in here. Um, you can reframe your life in the 50 hours if you continue and immerse yourself in the QLA dogma doctrine. If you don't, that 50 hours will just wash by like, uh, uh, you know, sand on a beach uh, and you'll be back to where you started. 
because 250,000 hours is a lot of hours. For those of you that are 60 or closer to 60, you've got almost a half a million hours that you're trying to replace with 50 hours. It's not possible unless you, every day, you immerse yourself in two or three hours of QLA. And when you hear it starting today, um, one of the stars, he says he, um, he um, listens to me 15, 20 minutes in the morning to get his program going, his QLA program. So he starts to think, in, in some of your cases, you'll say starts to think um, uh, savagely, or that's not, you know. You wouldn't know savage if it bit you in the ass. If I'm considered weak by a lot of the big hitters, where, where are you on the fucking scale, guys and gals? Where are you on the motherfucking scale? If they consider me a weak person, you're not even on the fucking scale. You're bigger than a cunt. Whatever's worse than a cunt. And when I say cunt, I mean coward. Just so everybody gets that straight. When I call you a vagina, you're a, you're a bigger coward than a cunt. Because vagina seems to me more graphic. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But to me, it is. So don't confuse me with the fucking facts. I mean, the... In my world, you wouldn't have lived past 15 where I came from. Nobody in this room. You just wouldn't have. It wouldn't have happened. Something else. Yes, sir. He started something, even though he was uncertain of the end result, he started with uh, the visionary, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's having been around some of these guys, it, it, it's, um, it's remarkable how, uh, you know, there was a movie, a movie, a book written many years ago, uh, men are from uh, Mars and women are from Venus or some bullshit like that about how we think differently. Not the least of which a woman, uh, average a woman says 30,000 words in a day and a man five to 6,000. That says it all right there. That says fucking motherfucking volumes. Woman can't keep her fucking trap shut. 30,000 words minimum. A guy five to six. A verbose guy, 6,000. A quiet introvert guy, four to 5,000. I mean, that explains the whole world. Uh, but in, in, in part of that, 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 uh, that thought process is that, um, these guys that I've been privileged to be around, just like I was privileged to be at the University of Pennsylvania, I said yesterday, I was. It's not like the place I went to school with for, for, for sure. And it's pretty much not like the schools that I've talked to, I had the privilege of speaking at, for the most part. Although Naval Academy was really special and Oxford was really special, but there, there is a uh, air of um, sureness on that campus that's hard to replicate. The kids know they're special because they're going to school there. Not bumfuck state university like uh, some of you went to. Uh, I went to a school you got to complain about. So I'm not de demeaning with some of you that went to shitbag schools. But it's just different. And down deep inside, you know it. The bad thing about it is, down deep inside, you don't think you can compete with them. But that's wrong. The only difference between you and them is their parents program them for success and your parents didn't so that's i could give a whole seminar why didn't your parents program you for success don't they love you because they're too fucking stupid that's why so we got stupidity after stupidity after stupidity generation after generation after generation and look what we got and as i said yesterday the two reasons they give we did the best we could which is just horseshit. And the next one is, you don't know what you don't know, which is a better answer, actually. Because they don't know. They don't know dick. That's why it's so hard to break the, poverty, the, the circle of poverty. Because they don't know. The blue-collar mentality. Some of you, if not amazing, most of you are a product of the blue-collar mentality here. You may have gone to school. You may have gone to med school. But most of you have come out of the blue-collar mentality. I.e., it's hard for you to make the changes. Not impossible, though. What else about Steve? Yes, sir. Oh, he's a extremely vindictive. All of them are vindictive, myself included. If you think, I mean, God almighty, where were you, where did, well, I, I say, where were you born? Well, I know, where did you, where were you raised? Fucking, uh, you know, um, I used to say on a farm, but th that's not really, you know, that's not really uh, appropriate. They're all vindictive. I'm not saying, and I'm not preaching that this is right. I'm just telling you that's what it is. And for you not to be prepared for that, you're fucking stupid and you're gonna fail. Because you don't have the same preparation as these other cocksuckers do. That's why you haven't competed. When I ask you, what's kept you from higher success well, in two or three different ways? And I ask the question two or three different uh, ways to see if I make sure I get the same answer. It's you all, 99% of the people come to me who say it's me that have kept me from taking the, you don't say this, taking the risk, getting out of my comfort zone, whatever. Because you're not prepared for it. And then one of the charts that, uh, last slides that we looked at last night, uh, you know, uh, when is enough enough? You know, don't you have it, you know, and, and then the scale of money, why money's bad and all that. You've been hearing that all your life. You've been hearing that. They've had studies over the last uh, 50, 80 years. They take twins at birth and they give one twin to, you know, uh, somebody in the ghetto, uh, which is really awful when you think about it. Why give them to a poor fucking, you know, that's what you have the ability to put. But anyway, that's a whole other story. 
And then you give one the, uh, the Trump, a Trump kind of family. And there's no comparison. Most of you maybe didn't go to the ghetto or the barrio, but close enough for government work. What else about, what else about Trump? Yeah. He doesn't bullshit himself. He doesn't, you know, the well, politics of blunt truth. Uh, we have uh, uh, two or three hours uh, the day after tomorrow. The, uh, the, uh, almost everybody that comes through here suffers from uh, the folly of themselves. In other words, they bullshit themselves. And uh, there's never an easy time to make a hard decision. When you're gonna kick your old lady to the curb, we have 60% divorce rate and business partnership breakup rate here. And we stopped counting at 60 because, you know, 60 is high enough. And, but we also, Part of that, um, a part of that statistic that we could have is the fact that um, we, we allow ourselves to cajole ourselves, to fool ourselves. And uh, like one, one of my favorite example, or one of my favorite examples, is people that run, run, run marathons. First marathon I ever ran, I ran three hours. The first, and I'm not an athlete. Three hours! I know kids that have come through this seminar, they run five, six, seven, eight hour marathons. If you're gonna run a seven hour marathon, you ought to kill yourself, metaphorically speaking, of course. And they say they're doing it for the experience. What positive repercussions can a seven hour po marathon possibly have? Unless you weigh 9,000 pounds and you lost 8,400 pounds or 500, uh, other than that, what, po what possible positive impact can a seven hour motherfucking marathon have on you? That's a brisk walk. Why? Because when, when I started running in the, uh, in the um, I guess it was the uh, late 60s, I ran because to get rid of hangovers. I used to run twice around Central Park in New York, which is about 10 miles, throwing up all the way. <coughs> Cause I'd been up drinking. I just maybe I didn't even go to sleep that night. And that's how I started running. Then I saw that. Well, fuck it. It knocks calories off. You run ten miles and you're puking your guts out. You know. I didn't even understand burning up calories in those days. And um, and then I played racquetball because I found if, uh, if my physical condition was uh, better, I could stay up more days and work longer hours. So I played racquetball two or three days a week, and I was a quite competitive racquetball player. In tournament level and so the better i had to get in better shape so i started running. so i got started running to play racquetball that's how it all started and um and then at that time uh there was a um uh, uh runner's world the magazine came out and uh the um a lot of the guys on wall street really to get rid of hangovers is how it started um now I, can, I know I just take an oxygen tank. Fuck, I, you know, why fucking run? Just take an oxygen tank now. But anyway, um, and, um, and then, but like everything else I do, and a lot of guys with OCD and a lot of high performance guys, well, I'm going to do it right. So I thought the first marathon I ran, I thought I was going to run 240. First marathon! I ran three and I was, I was not ashamed, but I was disappointed. I ran in Boston. And now, I mean, the, the kids, it's unbelievable to me that your standards are so fucking low. I know guys that never ran a foot. They can run a four hour marathon today. Today, without no any practice. You almost die at the end, but you've never pushed yourselves. And it gets back to almost everything you do. Something else about Steve. Yes, sir. Uh, he didn't care about ethics as long as it was legal. Now, success leaves clues, kids. Now, so far we've talked, uh, we've uh, studied Steve a little. And we've studied uh, Ray Kroc, right? Plus a bunch of other examples. In any way, shape, or manner, or form, do any of those guys relate to you? No. Any? No. So what leads you to believe that you're going to be like a fucking uh, caterpillar that's going to appear like a fucking butterfly, right? Cat butterflies come from caterpillars, right? What are you smoking? Give me some of that shit. As long as it's not addictive. I used to say I was going to take heroin when I was 80, 30 years ago. Now I'm going to be 80, so I don't say that anymore. Now, now 90. Now 90, I'm gonna, I want to do, I want to do drugs. I want to get high on life. Like, so, you know, I want to, you know, zen out and that kind of shit. And, um, but now that, now, now it's 90, I pushed it off because I'm going to be 80 in a few years. I don't feel like I'm going to be 80 in a few years, but I don't feel any different today than I did 50. I do feel a little different than when I was 40, but I take my bloods every six to eight weeks. My bloods are that of a, um, 30 to 40 year old. My testosterone's off the chart like Neanderthal, man. Um, okay, what else about Steve? Sir. He didn't care if he was lying or not. I'm glad you said that, VMI, because everybody in this room suffers from that. Even a couple of the people that you think you think you're a hard ass in here, you're nothing. You're a fucking uh, like a, uh, remember the uh, dessert we had the first night, those, uh, those puffy things with uh, um, custard inside and chocolate? You're not even that tough. 
And that's why I want you to practice because from the chairman, when you get down to the motivated sellers, you ought to roll over them like a fucking Sherman tank because you've got the benefit of all those meetings. Okay, what else about Steve? Yes, sir, in the back. He wasn't wanted as a kid from when he was born. I said this at dinner, I think the first night, half of you are mistakes. I bet my life on it. I don't mean the kind of mistakes that you're six, eight years difference in, in, in from your brother or your sister. I don't mean that. Don't ask your mom because your mom's, your mom's put up with you and carried you. They deserve better. But after you're back a while, don't go out of your way to go see your dad or talk to you. But next time you talk to your fathers, ask them. But it's got to be eyeball to eyeball. Was I a mistake, dad? And this is going to be the answer for almost at least more than half. And if you don't know what that universal like that means, then you're as stupid as you look. And it's been proven from the second trimester thereabouts, the kid can hear shit, you know, in the mommy's tummy. So your parents, biological parents, whether they're married or not, your dad comes home and your mom's all giddy and happy uh, because she's pregnant. She can't, can't wait. The, the commercials they have here, it's, it's something turns blue. You know, you take a test or some shit, some shit turns blue and then the guy's all happy. What a fucking joke that is. <laughs> he probably slaps the bitch. But anyway, that aside. So uh, your biological mom tells your biological dad, we're gonna, and I could spend a whole month talking about we're pregnant. That's a whole other fucking subject, uh, sore subject with me. Not worrying about, you're pregnant, you fat bitch, not me, you. But anyway, so she tells the biological father, and he starts screaming at her, God damn it, they're repossessing my car. We're two months behind on our uh, apartment rent, and you can have a fucking kid? Well, she, the kid heard that. The kid heard that. And that's not, and then every time the father, biological father looks at you, and several of you in this room were raised by one parent. I don't even have to ask which one of the fucking parents it was. Does anybody have to even ask? Only the woman's stupid enough to keep the fucking kid. And if it didn't come out hanging from a fucking cord, they wouldn't keep it either. And that umbilical cord never goes away. Right, moms? It never goes away. Okay, what else about Steve? Yes, sir. I felt like he lived in a different reality, and uh, and that's what explained why he was the way he was. That's what they say about me. I don't live in the real world. One of the reasons we moved up here, other than the security, because they were trying to kidnap the kids. Now, I'm not even going to go. This, I'm not even going to touch upon that on the seminar. But that's a big problem that you haven't even thought about creating generational wealth. And they're going to snatch your fucking kids. We used to say they're going to snatch Kelly and they'll give her back in six hours. We used to say that, but they tried to kidnap the kids before. So we moved up here. This place is easily defendable. We used to have the uh, Chris Frith, who was the head of security um, for Queen Elizabeth, retired Marine. So I've been through that. The seminar is not going to cover that. We talk a little bit about it at the hardcore because uh, they're closer to that. But um, the um, we live in a different reality. If you think Elon Musk lives in the same reality you do, I mean, what are you smoking? I mean, you should have been on Joe Rogan having a joint with Joe. And they develop their own reality. What else about Steve? Yes, sir. You know, like I said, if I was to judge you by the people, your close associates, colleagues right now, almost everybody in the room would be judged poorly. Machiavelli said a ruler is judged by the people he surrounds himself by. And I've, you know, when I think back, I've always been attracted to guys that were bigger and stronger. And I'm not a small guy, okay? Bigger and stronger than I was. I don't know why. In my group, I wasn't the toughest and I was pretty fucking tough. But in my group, I was probably out of six guys, maybe I was number five tough. Yes. And we fought amongst ourselves. And I know four of the guys, at least four, used to beat me up almost regularly. Unless I hit them with a chair or something from behind and they didn't know the fight had ensued, which I did a couple of times. And uh, one time, uh, a, a buddy of mine, Walt Wojak, who's still alive, recently lost his wife. Um, the, uh, uh, I hit him with a chair in a bar, uh, at the corner of Reseda Boulevard and Ventura Boulevard in the valley. I hit him with a bar stool. And bar stools don't collapse like in the movies. He went down like a ton of fucking bricks, but then he got up, much to my chagrin, and he beat me from the inside of the bar out into the parking lot, unconscious. Then he, they all went back in and just left me there. And they don't go in the real, they don't go and say, oh, how are you, can I get you? That's bullshit. That's in the movies. So I don't know if it was five or 25 minutes, I get up and I jump on him again, and he beats me right away uh, out into the parking lot, it beats me unconscious, and then they rip my clothes off. And let me, I used to wear a box. Boxer shorts used to be the rage back in the day, okay? Um, and you used to have boxer shorts that, uh, uh, with no button, so your pubic hairs would show. That was, that was the rage. And you used to wear penny loafers. Boxer shorts, penny loafers, and a t-shirt. That's it, that was the rage back in the day. Anyway, so he beats me, and then they take my clothes off, and they pin it up with nails behind the bar. And now those clothes stayed there for 15, 18, 20 years. Now that, that bar is down, there's no bar there in the corner of, of Reseda Boulevard and Ventura Boulevard anymore. Um, but I've always been attracted to, uh, you know, not 
sexually attractive, but attracted. I wanted to be around tough guys. Now, now I know because I wanted to be tougher because I know my dad was a fucking like he, Incredible Hulk. My dad was a small version of the Incredible Hulk. Okay, you saw something else in addition to Steve. Yeah, Mark. Huh? Yeah, Mark. Okay, Locke. Take away. We, we, we pounded poor Dan to death, but uh, take away about Dan. Yes, sir. I used to think about getting laid as a young guy. That's all I thought about. I didn't realize that I was that unusual. Apparently I was. All I thought about was pussy. And ergo, I got more ass than a toilet seat at a bus. Actually, somebody correct. Bus depot is actually the toilet seat's been ripped off. Basically, it's only the porcelain that's left on a toilet seat at a bus station. So I got more ass than a porcelain. I'm going to have to rephrase that. One of the YouTubers came up with something that's actually accurate because I, I've been in bus stations and this fucking thing has been ripped off. So it's uh, the porcelain part of then. Uh, so, um, okay, what, what about um, Dan? Other than all this? Yes, sir. He's very confident. Now, oh yeah, now he is. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, yeah, now he is. But, um, and I reminded him, and as his wife pointed out, I think, yeah, well, only you knew him back then. Which is true, I did, other than his mom. And his mom. Okay, you saw something else in addition to Dan, which was? The lion. The lion. Yeah, the lion. Take away about the lion. When you're the king, little things don't matter. Sometimes you have to remind them that you're the king. Correct. And you're going to have to remind them that you're the boss, especially the young kids. For the doc, he, he, it's easier for docs. Because they give you a benefit of the doubt you shouldn't have. You shouldn't, because you're dipshit like everybody else, but you're a medical doctor dipshit. But I mean, they will give you the benefit. Uh, the nurses that go into the healthcare thing, they'll get the benefit, okay? Uh, the, um, there's certain professions. When you're a lawyer, you get no benefit across the board because you're just considered a cheating, lying thief. <laughs> you get no benefit, okay? But I mean, uh, there's certain professions where you get a benefit in the QLA model, just because of the education. Uh, Pardon? Engineers get no benefit for anything other than being slow, too meticulous, and spreadsheet everything to death. Okay, any other comments about uh, the stuff you saw last night?